Howdy uh, and welcome everyone to Texas A&M's Campus Sustainability Month uh, for 2021. Uh, excited to have you here with us today. So this will be our third, um, uh, I guess, uh, third virtual conference that we've done um, over uh, Virtual Earth Month or Campus Sustainability Month. You know, ever since the pandemic started, we just uh, transitioned to this format. It's been quite successful. I'm happy to ha have everyone here today. Um, but this is going to be a little bit different year. Um, so we are also going to be in, a, in an in-person event as well. So we will have an in-person event, Campus Sustainability Day. It's going to be this Wednesday coming up, week from today, October 20th. Um, it's going to be from 10 to 2 in a Rudder Plaza. And it's going to be really fun. The students are going to have a lot of great activities. Um, we're going to be giving away a really cool t-shirt. We'll have uh, some other opportunities to get some giveaway items as well. Um, so definitely hope that everyone comes out there and, and participates, but, you know, hopefully do it safely, wear your masks and all that good stuff, but we definitely hope to see you out there. Um, so what we have for you today is this virtual offering. Um, it should be a really exciting uh, conversation today. And uh, I just want to go over a couple things since we're on Zoom. I think everyone's probably a Zoom ex expert at this point. But if you just put your presentation into side by side mode, there's an option at the top of your Zoom screen. Um, they should be able to do that. Uh, I also I have turned on the live transcript, so feel free to enable that if you'd like to also uh, see what we're saying. It does a pretty good job. Um, it messes up some words, but it works pretty well. At the very end, we are going to have opportunity for a Q and A. So if you have questions, please you know write those in the chat at any point during this uh, talk, and um, you know I'd be happy to ask those to our presenters at the end. And just so you are aware, this is recorded. This is being recorded, and we will have this up on YouTube, up on YouTube, um, you know, um, as soon as possible. And also, this is uh, you know you might be here for the prizes, so uh, you know that's cool. If you are, you're going to hopefully get some good knowledge as well. Um, but we are going to be giving away prizes for participating in our virtual events um, for this semester. And uh, you actually are going to earn points by collecting code words during each, vir each virtual event. And one code word is going to be equal to one point, and then you would redeem that for one entry. And we'll have a random draw um, to get our, our giveaway items. And the, these code words, they'll be written on a PowerPoint slide. Uh, they could be spoken or they may be written in the chat. So those are the different ways you can get code words during this presentation. And what we'll ask you to do is keep track of them. You know, you're going to have to just keep track of them on your own. And then after you've collected all of them, whenever you're done participating, um, then email those to sustainability at tamu.edu. And uh, you actually have all the way up until October 31st um, at 11.59 PM to submit your code words to our email. And that you have that extra time because we will have these up on YouTube. So you could go and watch at a later date if you weren't able to catch, catch it live. Um, so you can earn up to five points per event when you watch live. And we really want to incentivize, you know, watching this live so you can earn up to five points that way. If you watch this event on YouTube, you'll only be able to collect one of those code words instead of the five. So definitely trying to incentivize, incentivize live attendance. And you can also um, use the Maroon Base app to get some additional prizes. Uh, this event is currently not loaded. Um, we're working on getting the other events loaded, so don't worry about it for this event. But you can you can use this towards those cash prizes available in Room Base. It's an overall um, campus um, initiative, so not through our office, but we do have a sustainability channel. And if you just want all of the rules, um, go to our website. Um, there's uh, some event information on the homepage. You can click on there, and that'll get you to this web page I have listed right here. Um, that will go over everything in detail how to how to acquire all of that. And um, oh, and the prizes, you know, I think you probably care about the prizes. So you could win a Yeti cooler. Um, you could win a GoPro Hero 8. Um, and then so that's the grand prize. Then you get to choose between those two, whichever one you want. And then you could also get a Patagonia quarter zip pullover. We have two of those runner up prizes. And if for some reason you're a grand prize winner, and you'd rather have that. You know, you, we can we can get you that instead of the Yeti. If you want to save us some money. Um, and then you can also just get prizes just for participating. You don't have to, you know, win just for participating. And all you have to do is collect some code words. So if you collect two code words, you'll get a water bottle. If you collect three code words, um, you'll get a, one of our vintage t-shirts. And if you collect five code words, you'll actually get both. So uh, lots of incentive for you there. And um, with that, um, I'm going to stop, uh, stop sharing, sharing my screen. I'm going to kick it over to Tala and Nikki, and they are going to talk to us about education, the education system. And I think it should be really interesting. 
um, because uh, we often think about sustainability as just environmental, but they're going to be looking at a social component of sustainability. So ladies, whenever you're ready, take it away. Tala, I think you're muted. Howdy, welcome to our presentation. We're very excited to have you here. Our title is Education Under a Magnifying Glass. My name is Tala Karbat. I'm a senior public health major. Howdy, my name is Nikki Lin, and I'm a senior in chemical engineering. And we are interns with the Office of Sustainability. Our mission at the Office of Sustainability is to respect, protect, and preserve our resources. All of our work can be tied to the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals that you see here. These goals were adopted unanimously by 193 heads of state and other world leaders to wipe out poverty, fight inequality, and tackle climate change over the next 15 years. These are meant to address the needs of people in both developed and developing countries, really emphasizing that no one should be left behind. Often when we think of sustainability, we think about climate change and the environment, but sustainability also means improving people's lives. And that's why today we want to look at goal number four, quality education. The peer reviewed articles and journals we looked at did not have a consensus on what quality education means or looks like. And so that's something we're going to talk about today. The United Nations has listed a few targets for achieving this goal, however, and these targets include early childhood development and pre-primary education, skills and literacy and numeracy, relevant skills for employment, knowledge and skills to promote sustainable development, and qualified teachers. Education is really important for upward socioeconomic movement. For many people, it's an escape from poverty. The United Nations did a study, however, and as of 2018, one in two children and adolescents did not meet minimum proficiency standards in math and reading. In another study done by the United Nations conducted on 10 countries, children with disabilities were 19% less likely to achieve minimum reading proficiency. COVID-19 has also had a negative impact on education. On the next slide, I want to talk about an infographic created by the United Nations. According to their data, COVID-19 has wiped out 20 years of education gains. Um, first, an additional 101 million or 9% of children in grades one through eight fell below minimum reading proficiency levels in 2020. Um, in addition, participation in organized pre-primary learning increased from 2010 to 2019, but in 2020, many children became extremely reliant on caregivers at home. Finally, school completion rates are likely to worsen due to COVID. And so, um, what does quality education mean and how can we achieve it? And to answer this question, we're going to look at three factors of education. We're going to look at accessibility, especially for minority and special needs kids. We're going to look at funding and how our resources are allocated. And we're going to look at ideologies and how those shape and vary our curriculums. And then finally, we're going to talk about some solutions to make our education system more equitable. And so now I'm going to hand it over to Tala to talk about accessibility. Thanks, Nikki. So the first factor of having quality education is accessibility. And unfortunately, not have everyone has access to the same educational opportunities and minorities are victims to this. So when talking about minorities, I'm referring to racial and ethnic groups, low socioeconomic status and low income families, as well as students with disabilities. Um, so the main factors of student success are small class sizes, challenging curriculums, and qualified teachers, all of which predominantly minority students don't have access to. Um, so actually schools with um, a high concentration of minorities are twice as large as um, schools that are predominantly white and their class sizes are up to 80% larger. So when looking at this image, the achievement gap um, between children of color and low income status, um, the ones that stood out to me the most were fourth grade students have lower reading test scores and high school um, students of color are less likely to graduate. 
This gap is a result of minorities having inadequate access to quality education. Now, when looking at students with disabilities and other minority group, there are programs um, to protect their rights, including the American with Disabilities Act. Um, this allocates um, accommodations such as public accommodations and school um, additional programs to support them. However, the biggest problem with this is that there are many programs, um, including the Georgia Network for Educational and Therapeutic Support, um, which denies students of these accommodations. So instead of providing these extra supports and aids to them, they segregate them from their peers, um, which denies them participation in extracurriculars, developing their social skills, and going through a normal school experience. So two factors affecting access accessibility are lack of qualified teachers. The first one is lack of qualified teachers. So when looking at this image, we see the three components of having a qualified teacher, including being caring and nurturing, connecting with students and being experienced. So when we talk about experience, 25% of new teachers are actually not certified. Um, and unfortunately, predominantly minority schools are the most at risk as having these teachers. Um, Specifically in math and science, over 50% of students in predominantly minority schools do not have a, student, a teacher, a science or math teacher with a degree in their field. And unfortunately, since their schools are much larger, they do have larger class sizes as well, which makes it very difficult for teachers to connect with their students, denying them of that personal mentorship. Um, and the second component of affecting accessibility is curriculum offerings. So with larger classes, they have less access to resources. And unfortunately, predominantly minority schools don't even have, most of them don't have math or science college level classes. This is a problem because when applying to universities, many students are denied um, the right to be on a competitive level with the rest of the state and the country. Um, so when they don't have access to proper technology, um, such as computers and labs or high quality books, um, and resources that sets them behind. This means instead of giving everyone the same opportunity, these students are set behind because they don't have equitable access and minorities are affected the most by this. So going on to our second factor funding, um, we are going to talk about reform and reallocating resources. And that is our first code word for today. So if you hold on to this word, um, you'll gain a point to win one of our prizes. So how are schools funded? Um, school funding comes primarily from local and state governments, including state and property tax. So because of this, wealthier areas um, have more funding, and this creates a disadvantage for low-income families and their school districts. Um, so there are initiatives to increase um, funding per person per year at low-income schools, and this was shown to have a directly higher correlation with student success rates and their scores on tests because this money went to having smaller class sizes, better more qualified teachers, and more resources. However, since the 2007 recession, there have been a lot of funding cuts, and this has been slowly and gradually growing before and after COVID. So unfortunately, the state is cutting budget and allocation of funds towards education. This is a problem because we're at risk of losing 750,000 teaching positions. So not only do we already have a shortage of qualified teachers, but we are at a shortage of teachers in general. So losing this many positions means students are going back to having larger class sizes and less being able to connect less with their teachers. And that decreases their learning quality overall. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Nikki to introduce the third factor of education ideologies. So each state has academic and educational standards that apply to public schools. Um, these are statements about what students should know or be able to do as a result of school. They conventionally emphasize knowledge and skills, but recently they have been brought in to include attitudes and values such as character building, patriotism, and respect for human life and rights. These are not set by the federal government, and so curriculums can vary from state to state. For example, um, sex ed is one that um, does not have a consistent or um, uniform um, educational standard. For example, in more conservative states like Texas and Louisiana, you'll see them teaching sex ed as abstinence, 
Whereas in more progressive states like Illinois and Virginia, you'll see them teaching healthy sex habits. And this is affecting our students because students who grew up in low income communities and have less access to proper sex ed, they are three times more likely to have unwanted pregnancies compared to their counterparts in high income communities. And this example not just um, shows us what ideology looks like, but it also shows us how accessibility, funding, and ideology um, all impact someone's educational experience and outcome. And so this next quote summarizes it well, that quality has become a dynamic concept that has to constantly adapt to a world where societies are undergoing profound social and economic change. And so these are just three factors out of many that affect education. So we're going to shift into an activity to hear a little bit about your educational experiences and talk about other factors. One moment, please. Stop sharing. Okay. All right, this so, one's better. Yes, it looks good. So y'all go. can scan this QR code or y'all can go to this website um, and enter the password. Um, your responses will be completely anonymous. We're just going to ask um, what you liked and what you didn't like about your educational experiences. And y'all can share however much or little as you'd like. So we'll give y'all a second to do that. Looks like we're almost there. Give y'all like three more seconds. Okay, so the first question, um, what was something you liked about your education? And again, your responses are anonymous. You can share however much, however little you want to. We'll give y'all about a minute to do that. These are some great responses. Um, can definitely relate with a lot of them. These are all very important. So I'm gonna give you all a few more seconds. Tight knit community. I see good teachers is being repeated very much. I agree. Hands on experience. Okay. So if there are any more responses, I'm going to, okay. Um, so yeah, these are all very important things. I can definitely relate with the good teachers. I know I've had an experience with physics specifically um, where my teacher, first of all, was not a certified teacher. She was an engineer, so she was educated, um, but she wasn't qualified to be a physics teacher. And I was doing very poorly in that class and as soon as I got a teacher, a tutor, my grades significantly increased and my understanding for the subject was very, very different. So this just shows that having a good teacher really does make a difference. Um, being in a caring environment where you feel supported, the tight knit community, the opportunity to work with mentors. I, that is an opportunity I feel like not everyone would get, especially in a large school. So with that, we're going to go into our next question what was something you did not like about your education? So with this one, we're trying to see what opportunities some of you had that others maybe didn't. And I'm just gonna make a quick note that if you're doing it on your phone, you're gonna have to hit like next question to answer this one. 
todo el tiempo. All right, so let's see, we've got bullies, lack of AP dual credit. I can relate to that. I went to a really small school that did not have a lot of AP classes. Um, really big class sizes, class sizes. That's coming up a lot, actually. Coaches for teachers. I think that ties to what Tala was saying about whether they're qualified or not, or have time to invest in that. Um, unqualified teachers. Few opportunities to take upper level classes. Homework, yes. <laughs> Lack of diversity. Okay, so I want to point out, um, especially with teachers, some people had good teachers that we saw from the last questions, but apparently a lot of other people didn't. And that just <laughs> goes to show that education isn't, um, the quality of it isn't consistent for everybody. Um, I know something I didn't like about <laughs> my education was class sizes as well. Um, my high school, we had small classes, about like 10 to 15 students to teachers, which was great because I got to know all my teachers really well. But then coming to college and being in engineering, my classes are easily 100, 200 students. And it's a lot harder to get to know my profs that way. And even if they have office hours, just like talking to my friends, it's hard to make that accessible to everybody. But thank you, everybody, for sharing. Um, we're going to do one more. Um, this one is a word cloud. And so y'all can scan this new QR code or go to the link at the top. We're going to ask what quality education means to you guys. And y'all can put in however many um, words you'd like. Just remember to submit them one at a time. So I'll give y'all one more minute to do that. All right, I think we're almost there. We'll give you all a couple more seconds. And then if you weren't able to join now, the code will always be at the top of the screen. All right, so um, as I said, what does quality education mean to you? And y'all can go ahead and put in your responses. Let's give you all about like 30 seconds. I love the way this is coming together. So these are all very important points. Education is more than just the three, three factors we talked about. Um, funding, access, and ideologies are just three things, but really education is so much more, and this just shows. I'm gonna give you all a few more seconds if anyone wants to enter any more. Community, good food, equity. Equity is an important one. Support, inclusion. That's great. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Nikki. Oh, still getting a few responses. Okay, we'll give you all a few more seconds. Okay, so I just want y'all to keep all these points in mind um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Nikki to summarize our presentation. I just need to. There we go.
Can you all see? No. No. What about now? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's good. All right. So in summary, uh, many students lack accessibility, funding, support, and more that deny them proper education. And this is especially affecting minorities, um, including those with special needs in low in, um, in low income districts. But um, in our research, we found some solutions that we would like to share with you all. Um, the first is just being educated about inequalities in our education system. Just being aware of the problem is the first step towards finding a solution. The second solution is auditing. And auditing is different from accreditation and student assessments. Um, accreditation has been criticized as being too broad, too costly, or formulaic. And it doesn't assess the academic experience of many students. Student assessments are also not applied at all public schools. And so that's why that's criticized as well. Um, in addition, both of these are unhelpful to well-established colleges and universities that are already performing above the threshold. And so auditing is different because auditing is a more regular form of accountability. It's having somebody from outside of the school come in um, evaluate your school, make sure that you are reaching your goals, that you are meeting the standards, and that you're continuing to improve. And even though this isn't done in the U.S. yet, it's being done in parts of Europe and China, and so those are some countries um, and places that we can follow their example in. The third solution is public programs, just increasing um, the public programs we have available. Some already exist, such as child care subsidies and early Head Start programs. Um, these are meant to help with child development and also offer support and services to low income families. Um, and tax credits are another option. And finally, um, um, our last solution is reallocating our resources from administrative superstructures to programs that equalize education spending, enforce higher teaching standards, and reduce teacher shortages. Um, also reallocating our resources to increase teacher salaries and hire better qualified teachers. And so administrative superstructures can be looked at in two ways. The first is within schools, just as extracurriculars or extra programs, um, which are important for child development. But um, just keeping in mind that we should also focus on students and making sure that everybody is receiving the proper education and succeeding first. Um, it emphasizes that no person is left behind. Um, the second way that administrative superstructures can be looked at is just within the government. This next image is the spending by source categories and agencies in 2020. Um, this is from Data Lab, an official US government website. And what you'll notice is that most of our spending goes towards income security and social security. That is 36% of our spending. That is $2.4 trillion. Um, compare that to education though, which is here at the bottom. That is about 4% of our spending. That is $200 billion. And notice also that education is actually grouped with training, employment, and social services. And so education is actually receiving much less than that. Um, but really our goal in this presentation and in these solutions is to make y'all aware and to promote equitable education. And so that's something that Tala is going to close us out with. So ultimately ensuring an equitable education for everyone is what we are hoping to achieve, um, whether it's addressing academic needs of minority students, creating a safe and supportive environment, as well as protecting the health and safety of students. So ultimately, equity is what we are hoping to achieve. And this differs from equality um, in a several ways, although it is usually used interchangeably. So when looking at this image, these three men are what, trying to watch the baseball game. And in the image labeled equality, they are all given the same support structure. While one of them, that support structure is not enough. And for the other one, he doesn't need it to begin with. So when we look at equity, um, the man who couldn't see in the previous image is now given two support structures and the first man does not need any at all. So equity means allocating resources and uh, accommodations to people who need them. So we are catering to people's unique circumstances and needs. Um, well, in reality, people have much more than they need while others are not only at the base at the fence line, but in a hole that they have to first dig themselves out of. And we don't just want equity, but we want justice. We want everyone to be able to receive 
a quality education without needing any accommodations or extra resources. Um, so that is the overall goal. Um, education is a very important factor that should be higher on our priority list. We have the means and we have the resources to make it happen. And an equitable and quality education um, is something that we need to work on. So we hope you all learned something new. I'm going to open the floor up for questions. All right, great. Thank you so much, Tala and Nikki. That was wonderful. Um, I personally learned a lot. Um, really good job. So uh, we're, uh, we're at four o'clock. I know this is uh, technically over at four here now. So if you need to jump off, I understand. <clears throat> I would love if anyone had some questions that they could come up with. Um, I'm going to give you a couple seconds to think of them. Maybe you could write some in the chat. Um, if you don't have any, I have, I have one I can share. Um, but I just quickly do want to share my screen so I can tell you a couple of things to look out for um, in case you need to go. So I'm assuming that y'all can see my screen now. And I just want to let you know that our next presentation is going to be on Monday, October 18th. It'll be 3.30 p.m. again. And uh, it'll be a couple of our interns, Jaden and Sylvia. And they're going to be talking to you about the house plant industry. Um, especially in, in terms of how much it has really grown during the pandemic um, and kind of the sustainability of that industry. And it should be a really interesting presentation. So join us. And also Tala and Nikki are in our sustainability internship program. Um, so if you're interested in this, if you want to, you know, be in their, their position in the future, please apply. Uh, we're going to be opening applications for um, spring 2022. Um, they'll open on November 8th and they will close on November 22nd. We'll send canvas wide emails. We'll be all over social media. So check that out. All right. So that's that's that. Now let's we can get back to the QA. Does anyone have any questions? Um, you can um, you can turn your camera on and ask. Um, and I don't see any questions in the chat so far. So I have a question I would like to ask. Um, so um, one thing that I was wondering is have you given any, like have you given any thought in terms of um, you know, quality of education and just how, how, what does that kind of mean? Like if we are to, you know, invest more money into our education, like how, would that, how would that be good kind of for our future or competing with, you know, kind of other countries and things like that? Because it seems like having a highly qualified population would be good for our country. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? I can start. Um, overall, having quality, and not just quality, but having a uniform education, I think is very important just for unity, um, for community, making sure that we're all working together. Um, just in <laughs> looking at today, seeing how divided we are politically, I feel like at the core, it's because we can't agree on fundamental facts. Um, everybody's getting their information from different sources. Um, but if we had a quality education that was uniform for everybody, everybody would be learning the same thing. We would have a standard set of facts for everybody to work off of and to build off of. Um, and that would just lead to less disagreements about like what's real, what's not, um, and lead to more uniform, um, a more uniform <laughs> America, yeah. Great, thanks, Nikki. Um, all right, uh, Tal, you can jump in if you want to offer anything else or I can move on to my next question. Yeah, I think looking at the bigger picture, if we if everyone did have a quality education and we reached that point where the general public was highly educated and um, we could put our efforts towards better things, towards working towards our future and competing with other countries um, rather than putting those efforts to fix the problems that we already have. So I think when we solve the inequity in our education, um, we'll have a lot of energy, a lot of funding to focus everything towards bigger things. Great. Yeah, thank you. And um, I know that in a lot of measures, the United States, um, in terms of like science and math and testing and things like that, we're not doing as well as other countries in, in those areas. And in fact, a lot of like our tech jobs and like really hot, heavily science based jobs are often being filled by people that are not, you know, here in the United States. So um, I think, you know, improving our educational system is really going to help with the sustainability and the future of our country. Um, so something we really need to think about. So thank you for that. Um, and then I just have one last question. I don't want to take anyone um, up at your, all y'all's time too much, but I'm thinking about education. You know, we're also talking about sustainability. People often kind of think about it, the environment as one of the first things that they would think about in terms of sustainability. 
Um, is there a way that we can kind of like would having more of an environmental or sustainable kind of focused education, would that do you think that could help improve our educational system or educational experiences? And if so, do you have any insight on that? I think having outdoor opportunities for learning is a simple way that a lot of schools can implement that we already do have on our campus, um, just giving us places to study, places being outdoors, um, just familiar, familiarizing people with their surroundings and teaching them more about the environment and how that affects us as a society is important. Um, I think that's a great thing that would add to the quality of our education and make it more holistic. So not just learning about, you know, history and math and science, but about the real world around us. Definitely agree with what Tala said. Um, ben, could you repeat the question one more time before I give my answer? I just want to make sure I'm on that. Yeah, basically, I'm just kind of wondering, is there any, um, would it be beneficial to kind of incorporate sort of environmental or sustainability education, you know, and would, would that kind of improve people's um, educational experiences? I think it definitely would. Um, kind of going off what Atala said, that giving people more realistic, um, maybe isn't the best word, but along that line, because as a society, you can notice that we're all shifting more towards sustainability, like companies are starting to include a sustainability team or incorporate that into their technology. I especially noticed that within like chemical engineering, like oil and gas companies are starting to focus more on renewables um, and just recycling and reducing their waste. And so educating our students on that will better prepare them for the future, for their jobs, um, but also just for the future in general of our communities. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you ladies, uh, that's all my questions. Uh, thank you all for joining us for our first uh, session of, for this semester. Please uh, come back on uh, next Monday there, the 18th, and join us for round two.